Centuries of Oppression, The Road to 1918. Chapter 9, The Second and Third Reform Acts. The working class were not fooled for long regarding the failure of the Great Reform Act to address their concerns. This, together with the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act, which introduced the deliberately hateful workhouses, is what prompted the popular Chartist movement. In the context of the motivation for the Second Reform Act of 1867, a parliamentary site states, the Chartist movement had peaked by the 1850s, but there was an acceptance amongst members of Parliament that there was more work to be done to remove anomalies in the system that the first Reform Act had not addressed. This gives the impression that Parliament was responding to the will of the people. I feel this is slightly disingenuous, though I would agree that the Victorians, for all their failings, did at least believe in rewarding contribution to the national good. There was a growing recognition by the political elite that the national wealth was increasingly dependent upon a new type of technological citizen, both of middle class and proletariat varieties. The Victorian era saw huge advances in science and technology don't let anyone tell you that the British Empire was won on the playing fields of Eton. It was far more to do with British mastery of steam power before anyone else and British engineering skill. Moreover, the great industrial cities were rapidly becoming the dominant economic forces in the land. At the Great Exhibition of 1851, half the exhibits came from Britain. The agricultural and rural lobby, including landed aristocrats, whose patronage had held sway over Parliament for centuries, were no longer the dominant powers. So, in part, the Second Reform Act was a response to the political rise of the nouveau riche mill owners. But perhaps more important was the rise of what became known as the Labour aristocracy. These were the skilled men that the country increasingly depended upon. Not just anyone could maintain the steam engine which drove a factory, and still fewer could make one in the first place. For a possible subtext to the actions of Parliament, recall that it was, in part, fear of revolt following the French Revolution and civil riots at home which formed the background to the Great Reform Act. That being so, was the Second Reform Act of 1867 something to do with the American Civil War, 1861-65? to The timing is suspicious. As Lang puts it, there were more than enough examples of recent violent political uprisings from Garibaldi's successful invasion of Sicily to the American Civil War to lend credence to fears of the consequences of entrenched opposition to the will of the people. We will see later that the 1918 Representation of the People Act, whose deep history I am addressing, followed the 1917 Russian revolutions. Coincidence? Possibly. I merely note that there is a strange consilience between major revolutions abroad and electoral reforms in the UK. What certainly did not underlie the Second Reform Act is sympathy for the idea of democracy. In the mid-Victorian period, democracy was still a dangerously radical notion. But the old emphasis on maintaining entrenched privilege had given way to a more egalitarian idea that, whilst the vote was not seen as a right, it was something that could be earned. In the context of the 1867 Act, the same parliamentary site quoted above states, there was no question of campaigning for the right to vote for women too. That is poorly phrased. There certainly was a question of campaigning for the vote for women. John Stuart Mill did just that with the subjection of women, 
the arguments of which he deployed in parliamentary debates leading to the 1867 Act. Stuart Mill had been elected MP for the City of Westminster two years earlier on a platform including votes for women. So the women's cause was very much in the ascendancy at or before the Second Reform Act. It's worth recalling that when John Stuart Mill started to raise the cause of women's suffrage, still only about 10 or 12 percent of adult men had the vote, and the very concept that democracy might be a good thing was still some way in the future, including for men. This illustrates that the more impenetrable political barrier was the enfranchisement of the working class, that is, the adoption of democracy, not the enfranchisement of women per se. This is a theme that will be repeated later in the suffragette era. A quote from Disraeli from his speech proposing the 1867 Act makes the establishment disdain for democracy abundantly clear. We do not live, and I trust it will never be the fate of this country to live, under a democracy. The propositions which I am going to make tonight certainly have no tendency in that direction. Can you imagine an MP today proposing a bill with an assurance that it would be absolutely uncontaminated by anything so vile as democracy? Nor had democracy stopped being a dirty word by the Third Reform Act. Even in 1884, leading politicians still regarded democracy as a dangerous tendency. The Third Reform Act, 1884, was essentially more of the same. More working class men got the vote, but the franchise was still household based and excluded nearly half of men. So, after all the hoo-ha and three reform acts, had there been no great change? No, that's absolutely untrue. Even though democracy was still not an accepted principle by 1884, inroads had been made into the previous self-perpetuating vested interests, and the scene was set for the eventual triumph of democracy in 1918. At the risk of stating the obvious, you can find some stupendously silly commentary on the internet, such as this. Political changes were very slow in coming from 1750 to 1900. Those that did come in 1832 and 1867 were seen as not changing a great deal, especially as neither gave women the right to vote. This fatuous remark dismisses all three Reform Acts as unimportant on the grounds that they did not give the vote to women. But these Acts increased the male franchise from about 4% of the adult male population to 56%, hardly an insignificant matter. And hardly insignificant even if your whole focus is on women, because without men pioneering a broader franchise, the ground would not have been prepared for women to do so later. It is a fine illustration of how the feminist mindset failed to appreciate that the fates of men and women are linked. The same phenomenon of man blindness blinkered the suffragettes and many of their contemporary female suffragists to the true obstacle in the way of their own enfranchisement, that of working class men but I get ahead of myself. In summary, the three Reform Acts of 1832, 1867 and 1884 respectively resulted in the proportion of adult men over 21 who had the vote increasing from about 4% to around 10%, then to 32% and then finally to 56% in 1884. And that's how it stayed until near the end of World War One.